first video in this three-part series on John and Terry Edison, the third one they tore up. This series is based on the famous first one they tore up, Step by Step Tutorial Taught by Dev Dog and Baseball Tom, and is divided into three parts. This video, part one, will be creating a simple hello world when they tore up using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We'll show you how to create a new project, we'll build some basic HTML for a hello world page, and show you how to handle a button clicker. Next, we'll show you how to switch between the built-in light and dark themes, and how to create your own custom CSS font. And finally, we'll show you how to use the Windows library for JavaScript WordMap. In part two, known as App Lifecycle and Save, we'll discuss the app lifecycle, and we'll extend the Hello World app by storing app data in Windows Roam and Settings, and saving session state data using the WinJS application session state app. In part three, we page control objects for navigation, we'll modulate our app to use the navigation app template and page control object, and we'll add an app bar to navigate between pages using the WinJS navigation slogan. I want to emphasize that the best way to learn is by doing. Don't just watch and learn from us. We designed this series so you can open up with this video and follow along step by step. Before you start, to complete this tutorial, you need to have Windows 8 installed. A free 90-day evaluation of Windows 8 is available for download. You will also need to install a version of Microsoft Visual Studio 2012. You can download a free version of Microsoft Visual Studio Express 2012 for Windows 8 available from www.microsoft.com slash express. You will also need a developer license. You can obtain a developer license by selecting a buy a new project and building a Windows Store app or directly from the store menu, select acquire developer license. Acquire developer license. Step one, create a new project in Visual Studio. The first thing we're gonna do is launch Visual Studio Express 2012 for Windows 8, just by typing the letter VS underscore chain when we see VS Express for Windows 8 and go ahead and click run. Now once this is open, select file, new project, and I'll just zoom in here so you can see it. Go ahead and select that and that'll show us the new project option. From here, make sure that the JavaScript Windows Store templates are selected and select the blank app template. With that selected, let's actually name our project Hello World. And we can choose whatever location we wanna save it to. And I'm gonna uncheck create a directory from Hello Chain. And with all that set, let's click OK to start creating the project. With our project created, select Solution Explorer, and you'll see that we built a minimal project that includes a number of different things. And let's just quickly walk through some of the files within our solution. If we expand references, you'll see that references include the Windows library for JavaScript and Chrome, and include CSS files for our dark and light UI, as well as some built-in JavaScript files. It includes a CSS folder that includes default.css, and it's used in the default.html page for the visual design of that page. It also includes a series of images, and these images are represented in different ways. For example, the logo and small logo images are displayed in the Start screen, while the Store Logo PNG is used to represent your app in the Windows Store. And finally, a Splash Screen PNG, which is used to show your app during Splash. It also includes a JS folder for all of your JavaScript files. By default, this includes default.js. A default.html page, which is a basic HTML page that we'll be editing in just a second. And finally, there's package.app.html. This is a manifest file that describes your app, including its name, the description used in the app, title, start page, splash screen, and all the images we saw before, and lists all of the files that your app contains. These files are essential to our Windows Store apps using JavaScript, and any project that you create in Visual Studio contains them. Step two, launch the app. At this point, we've created a very simple app. But if you wanna see what it looks like, you can either press F5 on your keyboard to build, deploy, and start your app, or you can click right here this button if you want to run it on a computer. There's our splash screen, and there's the page loaded that's that default.html page that just contains the text content close the app. There is no button or command to close the app, so to close the app, what we're gonna do is slide from the top edge, so our mouse can see the cursor towards it through here, and we'll slide it down towards the bottom edge of the screen, or press Alt and F4. Now that we're in the start screen, notice that deploying the app adds its title to the last group on the start screen. To run the app again, tap or click its title on the start screen. And of course, we can press F5 in Visual Studio as well. It doesn't do much yet, but congratulations, you've built your first Windows Store app. Step three, modify your store page. 
Let's just start to visual studio and take our time. And then solution explorer, select default HTML and go ahead and double click it to open it. To make it easier to see this code, I'm just going to increase our font size here to 140%. And you can always use the mouse wheel or the click mouse wheel to increase the size. And let's close this by hitting the close here. Our output window will give us as much space as possible. We can enter HTML tags. We have some head tags that include links to JavaScript files, CSS files, and so on, including one specifically for our product. What we're going to do, though, is add some HTML tags into in between the body tags. And here's the default.html page that Visual Studio created for us. Like any normal HTML page, there's an HTML tag surrounding everything, a head tag that includes links to CSS files, as well as JavaScript files, and then links to our specific project, default.css and default.js, that we'll be changing later. So now, what we're going to be doing is adding just regular HTML tags into our body tags to be able to have a user input some text and have a button click on it. So let's add a first level header for our title. And we'll say, hello world. Underneath that, we'll use a paragraph tag. And we'll say, what's your name? And from here, you can just add regular HTML input. You can say input. And let's just call this ID name input. And the type will be text. This is where users can actually input some text. And we'll add a button. And let's just call that hello button. And we'll say what's your name? All right, so there's our button control. And let's add a div here. And this is going to be the output of our click button. this a little later for our button click and that you can actually display it by setting the inner text of this div in this case here. So what we've done is replace the body with some large text hello world with the paragraph tag that includes just what's your name and right next to each other will be uh, input text box as well as a button click event labeled hello and there'll be nothing displayed here but we'll be adding that later for our app. We can go ahead and click F5 or, or one time so we can see what it looks like. So there's our page you see our big text and notice if we just type anything here, we can say, hello, world. In our next step, we'll go ahead and add the event here. So let's switch back to Visual Studio. We can click the stop button. Next is step four, create an event header. Now that we've written our HTML code, what we want to do is go back to the Solution Explorer, Explorer.js, and double click on the default.js file to open it. As before, I'm going to just expand this to 140%, so you can easily follow along. To see as much of this code as possible, I'm going to be using a Visual Studio command called Bolt Click. And that's Shift-Alt-Enter, or under the Quick Launch menu up here, you can just start typing in, if you don't know Visual Studio commands, full screen. And you'll see our full screen with Shift-Alt-Enter. We'll go ahead and click that. And notice this just gives us as much space as possible to see all the code within default.js. So the first thing we want to do here is just right click. I'm just going to use outlining collapse to definition. Outlining collapse to definition. And what this does is just collapses everything so that we can easily see all the different functions within our app. Now the first thing to notice is all of our code is actually wrapped up in an anonymous function that is self-executing. And we know that because it's right from here. And the reason for this is because it makes it easier to avoid naming conflicts or situations where you accidentally modify a value that you didn't intend to. As you may remember, JavaScript variables can be either local or global. So we want to make sure local variables, meaning variables that create in functions, don't interfere with the global namespace. So that's why all of the variables within here and all the functions are declared within this function to make them local instead of global. The next line of code turns on shift mode for JavaScript. And shift mode provides additional error checking for your code. For example, it will prevent you from using implicitly declared variables or assigning a value to a read-only value. As you can see, default.js also handles the unactivated non-checkpoint event. We go into more detail about these events later, but now I just noticed the activated event fires when the app starts. Now what we're going to do is after app.start is define our own function. And what we're going to do 
is the final in JavaScript function right before SSO. We're going to define a function named button start function. And let's write the function definition. If I start typing fun, I'll see if I click post into her class and hit tab twice. And now we can see it's a fill in the blank for button click handling. And click enter. And let's also make sure that button click handling is not a parameter in event response. With Windows 8, you don't need to worry about the difference between touch, match, and the other forms of pointer and click. You can just use events that you know, like the click event, and they work for all forms of input. And the first thing we're going to do is we'll create a variable named username, and that'll retrieve what the user actually typed into our text box. We'll use document.getElementById, and if you remember, our text box is named nameInput, and we want the value. Now that we know what the user has typed into that text box, the next thing we're going to do is build a greeter. Now let's build our greeter. We'll call this guy greeting string. Input no. And we'll use a variable. And this is concatenating string here. We'll play back whatever the user typed into the text box. Uh, wrapped in hello is now that we've built the message we want to display to display it, we're going to use document.getElementById, and we're going to find the greeting output div that we built earlier, and we'll set the inner text property equal to that string. So when this function is called, we'll get whatever the user typed into the text box, we'll retrieve a username, we'll build a custom greeting string that is hello, whatever the user typed in, and exclamation point. And then we'll display it back to the user by setting the inner text property of the greeting output div. Now that we've created the button click event handler, we have to register this function to call when the button's actually clicked. Step five, register the event handler when our app launches. To register this button click handler, you may be tempted to go back to the default button command class and use the onClick event to call the button event handler. Now one reason you can't do that is because it doesn't have a reference to the name. And that's because, as we explained earlier, this is all wrapped within an anonymous function. So there's no way for the event handler to be able to call button click handling. To do this, there's two ways. We can either define this in the global namespace by writing some code to define button click handler in a global namespace, or the preferred way is to add an event listener on app that's unactivated. And that's what we're going to show now. So let's expand the unactivated function. The code checks to see what type of activation is showing. In this example, it's checking for activation kind of launch. And the launch activation is used when an app is launched whenever it is not running and then the user activates it. Next, the code checks to see how the app was shut down the last time it launched. If the app's been newly launched, this code will execute. Otherwise, it's been reactivated from suspension and this else will run. And we'll cover this in much more detail in the Manage App Lifecycle and State tutorial. Whether it's been terminated or not, we're going to make a call to set promise when JS UI got processed out. This function scans the default that HTML file for when the driver for JavaScript was pulled and initializes it. So far, we haven't added any of these controls, but in step seven, we'll be adding a waiting control that requires this when JS UI got processed out to initialize the control. Now the call to process out is enclosed in a set promise method. This will make sure that the class name isn't taken down until the app's page is ready. Now a good place to register our event handler for non-Windows library for JavaScript controls is just after the call to WinJS UI got processed out. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to register our button click handler. Let's add a comment here saying what we're going to do. We're going to retrieve the button and register our event handler. To do that, we'll get a reference to our button handler, hello button equals, and we'll say document.getElementById. And if you remember, we called our button handler no button. Now that we have our button, we can say hello button and use add event listener. And this takes a couple different parameters. The first type is the click event. And now is where we point to our function, and our function is the button click handler. And that's 
so we're going to put the use capture boolean in. We're going to put the use capture boolean to false. And what that's going to do is have it instead fire to our target element and then its parent. If we want to fire to the parent first, we set it to true. Let's switch over to full screen mode and go in and click F5. Click the button to run our app. Now that our app is loaded, let's just open the new Kimberly Explore screen. We click Say Hello. Our event listener fires, displays our message, somebody special, with exclamation mark on the end. Now let's Alt Tab, back to Visual Studio, and go ahead and click Style. Step 6, Style or Citation. Let's just set the default that HTML. And notice that we have a style sheet, UI, Web Dev, CSS Support, and WinGL Front. This is the Windows Library for JavaScript style sheet. And it includes a set of styles that automatically give our apps a Windows 8 look and feel. And by using this style sheet, you get a number of benefits, including being able to work great with text displays, automatic support for high contrast mode, automatic support for other languages, and automatic support for other reading orders, like white to black. Now, as you may remember, these style sheets were declared in Windows Library for JavaScript under our CSS, and it's a, a UI dark and a UI light. What we're going to do is change our style to print in the UI light CSS so we can see the visual difference just by changing the CSS. To do that, make sure you're in default.html and we'll just change the name of it to UI light. With that one simple change, go ahead and click run and let's see what our application looks like now. As you can see, this did a number of changes. Obviously, our background color is now white, our fonts are darker, and even our button color changed. Now, which style sheet should you use? This really depends on what you want. For apps that mostly display images and video, we recommend using the dark style sheet. And for apps that contain a lot of text, we recommend using the light style sheet. Now, if you want to customize the look and feel of your app, you don't have to throw out the Windows library for JavaScript styles and start over from scratch. It's easy to make incremental changes by overriding the styles you want to change. So let's switch back to Visual Studio and let's tap our app. And you can override any style in the default style sheet by creating your own style sheet and including it after the Windows library for JavaScript style sheet. Now the blank app template already does this for you by defining a default.css style sheet and really building our custom style sheets in just a second. Before that, we actually need to define some classes within our HTML body. So let's define a class for our header, named header class. And next what we want to do is define a div tag. We're going to wrap everything with an M, so we can't take this end tag and put it at the very end our file even after doing a div tag. To make this a little easier to read, go ahead and select this div, right click and select format selection, and that'll just do some nice indenting to make it really clear what we're defining here. Now within this div, let's go ahead and call this class equal name tag. Next, let's define the styles for those classes, and we'll do that in Solution Explorer. Go ahead and under CSS, Double click on default.css to open our class. And we'll select 140% since we'll zoom in here and get a better view. And notice the generated file contains a few steps for defining styles for different views that are used within a Window Explorer app. We'll ignore these steps for now, but we'll play with them in a later tutorial. Now after the body class, let's define our classes and click the little define symbol, header class. And in these styles, we're going to be defining some of the app page default margins. The first thing we'll do is go up to top margin, and we'll set that with margin 10. We're going to put like a 45 pixel from the top to the header, as well as a left margin. And that left margin will be 120 pixels from the top. Now for name content, what I'll do is just copy and paste the name content within here. And let's make sure this is done here. For name content, we'll have a top margin of 31 pixels. We'll keep a left margin of 120, and then a bottom margin as well, 50 pixels. Next, let's define the styles for our greeter input. So we'll just call this class greeter input. And within here, we're going to define our height, 20 pixels. We'll also set the bottom margin for our head and body, and we'll put those at 45 pixels. Now that we've set these classes, let's go ahead and open our file and we'll run it again. And we see the different spacing instead of our text being on top of each other, we see uh, all the different values and each one is special. Let's tap again and run, and we'll see exactly what we're looking at.
is my first time in the studio. I'm going to take class. Just said it. Add a Windows library for job search today. So far in this tutorial, we've been using standard HTML controls, but you can also use Windows library for JavaScript controls. I'm using a pre built controls like a day picker, a flip view, a list view, and a rating control that you can add to your app. So, what we're going to do is just click on our default.html file and just double click it to open it, and we're going to add a rating interpreter. Click full screen now, and underneath our greeting I click do, we're going to add a label control. I click the four. Here's the type of greeting I can do. Thank you. This thing here lets us call this a computer. Now we have a label, it's actually build our rating control. It's a little different than what you'd normally expect. Instead of adding a rating element to our page, the way we build these JavaScript controls is by adding a div tag and setting the data win control property to the specific name of the control. So let's do that. Let's call our div ID equals, and we'll call this rating control div, so we can reference it later. And now let's set the data win control, data win control property equal to, and notice we do get intelligence, so this is win js dot ui dot rating control. I'll actually add a full screen now so I can just run this again. And there's our rating control, as well as our label. We can set these values, and now let's add some code to this. Go back to Visual Studio and click Run. Step A, register an event handler for a Windows library for JavaScript controls. Registering an event handler for a Windows library for JavaScript control is a little different than registering an event handler for a standard HTML control. Now the first thing we're actually going to do is add a new div, and this div is going to display the output from the rating control. So we'll just call it rating output. And we'll switch to our default JS, and what we're going to do is at the bottom of our file, so before app start, we're going to add a new function, and this function is going to be called rating div. So let's declare the function, rating div. Zoom here, let's make sure it actually passes an event info as a parameter. Now the event info parameter contains a detail.tentative rating property that provides the new user rating. So what we'll do is get a reference to our div, let's do that first, okay, rating output equals, and we'll use the document div element ID, and this is the div that we just added, and rating output. Now that we have that, we want to set the inner text of it, rating output dot inner text equal to event info dot detail dot tentative rating. Now that we've declared this function, we actually need to call it when the rating changes. And what we'll do is go back up to our on activated event, and we'll show some of the new things we need to do for Windows library for JavaScript controls. Now, if rating were a standard HTML control, we could add our event handler directly after the call to process our app, just like we did with our button event handler. But it's a little more complicated for a Windows library for JavaScript control, like our rating control. And since the process all method is asynchronous, any code that follows it might run before process all actually completes. So what we're going to do is use a promise object to receive notification when this process all completes. Now a promise is a promise that something will happen in the future, and when that thing happens, the promise is that they'll complete it. And promise objects have a then method. So if we see here directly on our code, and in between these two parentheses, we're going to add a dot then. And what this does is it's going to say any code within here, and we'll observe that this function called completed will execute after the call to process all is completed. So we have our method declared to our speech model, and we want to make sure to push all of our code within here. So we'll put the existing code directly within this completed method. And I want to add another parenthesis here. I want to make sure that we have a parenthesis for the set promise method. So all of those loops within set promise, we select this parenthesis, and we see this parenthesis is all the code that will happen within the, the then. And finally, the bracket is the declaration for the function completed. So what we'll do is add some code to get a reference to our rating control, and then use add event function until it's no longer needed. So let's 
what I'm gonna do is retrieve the gym that has the little engine in it. And for the mode that's normal, I have retrieve the gym. And we'll find it by using document.get.env. And what we're looking for is in the gym is the little wooden tree stand gym. Now that we have that, what we're gonna do next is retrieve the actual rating control. And let's type rating control equals rating control gym. That's the control we just found. And so dot gym control. And that's a reference to the actual rating control. Once we have that, we can also register our one home run. And the now we'll put rating control auto that little smoke. And the event we're looking for is the change event. The function we're going to use is rating change. And for our use capture, we're going to set that to false. So that's a review of what we've done. We added the process all and added the run method, which takes a function. And what's going to happen is the process all is going to run. And once it's complete, it's going to call our completed function. And within that completed function, we get a reference to the div, rating control div, that is hosting the rating control. We retrieve the actual rating using the gym control. And within the gym control, what we can do is add an event listener to the change event, passing in our function. And so there's our code, and I'm just gonna eliminate the one line. And we'll go ahead and just click run. And let's add some text here to say my second line in. Let's say I'm saying hello. Select our booting at four, and there's the checkbox now, followed by change event for the rating control, and set the div to that tentative rating. Congratulations, you've completed part one of Create a Hello World app. In part two, learn about life as a coach. We'll discuss the app life cycle and show how to store app data in Windows roaming settings. In session state data, use the WinDirect application session state app.